thing about Berlin is that it's always been a new city, even when it was old. In the first half of the 19th century, it was little more than a provincial town. But architect Karl Friedrich Schinkel almost single-handedly transformed it. His passion had been ignited in 1806 when French soldiers marched into Berlin, led by Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. Karl Friedrich Schinkel watched as Napoleon's troops marched into his city. French occupation was to rouse his patriotic fervor, but he vented his anger and his rage by creating some of the city's finest buildings. In less than 30 years, Schinkel dreamt up a series of new state buildings, including the Altes Museum, the city's first public museum. Schinkel used the elegance of ancient Greece to make a new city seem older than its years. Schinkel was to build his king and master a classical paradise, an Athens on the Spree. At last, Berlin was to become a European capital of consequence. And as a dreamer in stone, Schinkel's mind buzzed with ideas and forms. Not content with that, though, Schinkel also saw the future of architecture itself. And it came on a trip in 1826 to England. He sketched the grim mills and factories of Manchester and other northern towns, and he sketched them like a man possessed. Schinkel was torn. At heart, he was a romantic who yearned for beauty. But there was something about the industrial architecture that he encountered in England that excited him. Back in Berlin, he came up with a building that married the two and would take architecture in a wholly new direction. Our academy was finished in 1836. Nothing like it had ever been built before in Berlin, or indeed anywhere else. Schinkel had dreamt up a building that was elegant in appearance, but pioneering in construction. The Bau Academy now only exists in architecture books. The original building has long vanished from the city. Damaged during the war, the East Berlin Authority saw it as just another old ruin and demolished it in 1962. The Bau Academy is where Schinkel died in 1841. From overwork, they said. The Berlin that he left behind was now on the verge of greatness. A city like Schinkel himself, both romantic and progressive. By the turn of the 20th century, Berlin had become the most modern city in the Western world. The American author, Mark Twain, was a new visitor, a man familiar with the great metropolises of Chicago and New York. But it was in Berlin that he saw the future. No other European capital could touch it for innovation. It had some of the first electric traffic signals and street lights on the continent.
Berlin fizzed with activity. And everything had to be beautiful. Even the transformer stations that powered the city were works of art. Peter Behrens was an architect obsessed with reconciling advances in technology with artistic form. His turbine factory for the AEG power company was completed in 1910. hundred years on, it's still producing state-of-the-art turbines, and it still looks inspirational. Like Schinkel before him, Behrens instinctively understood the beauty inherent in the industrial form through the marriage of glass and steel and brick. Believe it or not, this building changed the course of architecture. Modernism, an architectural movement that embraced the new, was born. By the 1920s, across the city, new visions of living and working were springing up. Berlin had become a cauldron of creativity. On its edges, pioneering architects were commissioned to come up with new homes to take the masses out of the overcrowded city. The Hufeisen Siedlung, or horseshoe estate, designed by Bruno Taut, had more than 1,000 residences. Onkel Tromp's Siedlung, built five years later, would accommodate twice as many again. These estates were like garden cities, boldly colorful, the fruits of a society that celebrated the new. Modernism now led, and where Berlin led, the rest of the world followed, or so it seemed. From 1933, Berlin became Hitler's city. The rise to power of the Nazi party spelled the end of modernism, condemned by them as cosmopolitan rubbish. In December 1930, a young architectural student named Albert Speer heard Hitler at a rally. He was enthralled and his life transformed. Within three years, Speer was working for Hitler and the pair were inseparable. Together they planned to transform Berlin into Germania, a new capital for the Third Reich. Speer would build on Schinkel's legacy to create a new city of the future that would last for a thousand years. A huge north-south processional route would cut through the center of the city. At its northern end would be the heart of Germania itself, the Große Platz. So this is where it would have been, the giant square, der Große Platz. 
To the west, Hitler's own palace. To the east, the existing Reichstag. To the north, the crowning glory of Germania, the People's Hall, the Volkshalle. Its dome 16 times higher than the dome of St. Peter's. Just imagine. And then to the south, at the end of a grand avenue, the largest triumphal arch in the world, dwarfing the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. In fact, everything in this city would have been designed to dwarf everything in it and around it.